You guys asked when I was gonna use that title again, so here you go. We were wrong about the M1 MacBook Air, but I am so glad that we, along with many others, were wrong. And I'll explain why in just a bit. Hey guys, it's Max, and welcome to my long-term review of the 2020 M1 MacBook Air. It's incredible. There are zero issues with it. Yes, you should buy it. Eight gigs of RAM is fine and seven core graphics don't matter. It barely thermal throttles. It is stupid fast. We have links to the best deals down in the description. Click that circle above to subscribe. This has been Max and I will see you in the next video. All right, all right, fine. I will expand on my experience after two weeks with this machine with some really interesting findings. But if you guys don't wanna watch any more, that summary is completely accurate. I absolutely loved the previous Intel MacBook Air, but it had a few issues and downsides which I'll cover, but the biggest one was how dang hot it got, even from basic tasks. And if you did something somewhat difficult, the fan would scream, and even at full speed, it wouldn't cool down until a few minutes after you quit what you were doing. Because of that, we recommended people to buy the dual core i3 model with weak graphics because the quad cores would thermal throttle and slow down anyway. But even the i3 would be loud if you are web conferencing and watching a video at the same time. That is because Intel CPUs run hot and Apple's cooling solution sucked. But I still loved it and picked it up over the 13 inch MacBook Pro for normal use because I love the design. The classic wedge shape not only looks great, but it's also more comfortable for typing since the edges don't dig into your wrists like they do with the boxy pros. I'm also a sucker for the gold color, which you can't get with any other Mac, and the Air doesn't have the annoying touch bar. With that said, if I had to do anything mildly intensive like photo or video editing or even multitasking, I would have to go grab a Pro, but not anymore. Now, yes, it is slower than the Pro and I'll show you exactly how much slower soon, but that's no longer an issue. I know it's no longer new, but the Magic Keyboard is fantastic to type on and thankfully we have no reports of reliability issues since it has come out. The trackpad is also the best of the best. Now, yes, it is slightly smaller smaller than the pros, but I've never noticed a difference in usability when switching between them. The speakers are also very good, better than pretty much all Windows laptops, and it's actually louder than the M1 MacBook Pro, albeit slightly worse quality. Go ahead and take a listen for yourself. With that, the webcam is still the same 720p module Apple has been using for years, but the M1 chip's image signal processor does a better job at video processing. Here it is side by side with my favorite Windows laptop, the new XPS 13 9310. I'm not sure if the microphones were changed or just the audio processing, but it sounds fantastic. And for reference, here is how the Dell's mic sound compared to it. This is the microphone quality from the Dell XPS 9310. This is the microphone quality of the M1 MacBook Air. Because of that and the new fanless design with the M1, I believe that the MacBook Air is the best web conferencing laptop on this planet. The SSDs on the Air were decent before, but they were slower than the Pros, but now they are much faster, which helps opening apps and with RAM swap. Another issue I had with the MacBook Air was the display. Now the resolution was always great with a retina rated 2560 by 1600 resolution, which is a perfect blend of sharpness and battery life compared to many Windows laptops where you have to choose between 1080p or 4K. My complaints were the brightness and colors. When this design launched, we had no true tone, which adjusts the white balance based on your lighting, but Apple added that later to match the MacBook Pros. Next was brightness. It launched at 300 nits, but then they updated it to 400 nits, which is still dimmer than 500 of the Pros, but not enough to matter for most. The last thing was colors. The Pro supported DCI-P3 colors, just like iPhones and iPads, which makes it the clear choice for those that are serious about photo or video editing, but thankfully, Apple finally added added it to this M1 MacBook Air. And when you consider the 256 gigabytes of base storage at $999 compared to 128 gigabytes for 1200 when it launched in 2018, it is an incredible value. And that's without taking performance into account. 
So let's finally talk about it. Compared to the 10th gen Intel base 2020 MacBook Air, the new M1 chip absolutely smokes it. And what I'm showing you is the very best i7 model MacBook Air, which was a $250 upgrade. Here is the i5 quad core, which was a $100 upgrade. And finally, the base model that the M1 chip replaces at the same price. Where it becomes really comical is when we add in the very best i9 quad core processor in the 16 inch MacBook MacBook Pro that you'll spend at least $2,700 on. Now, of course, this doesn't account for thermal throttling, which we'll cover in a sec, but here's how the Air compares to the very best new 11th generation Intel i7 in the top spec XPS 13 that costs at least $1,700. But wait, there's more. That is with the XPS plugged in. When we unplug it, the performance drops dramatically, and that's with Windows and Dell power settings set to maximum performance modes. Whereas the M1 MacBook Air performs the same regardless and it's completely silent. Basically what I'm trying to say is that this thing is an absolute beast. Now as far as single core performance, the M1 chips are the highest that I've ever seen and because of that, everyday tasks feel much snappier than my $15,000 Mac Pro. Now I'm not going to get into the crazy specifics like wattage, frequencies, and how the M1 is pulling this off. Let's just call it magic for now and let's leave the details for our MacBook Pro review. If you guys want to see that, click that subscribe button below. As for the graphics, it's also impressive, smoking the Intel MacBook Air, and once again, that was the best i7. Comparing it to the same price i3 model, it is just embarrassing. And this is the seven core GPU, not the eight core. Now, of course, these are benchmarks and not real world tests. So here's me video editing and exporting a five minute color graded 4K project. The i7 MacBook Air took 19 minutes and 40 seconds, and the M1 took three minutes and six seconds seconds, and I didn't even want to test out the base i3 model that's priced the same. The same project in DaVinci Resolve took 5 minutes and 40 seconds, and the brand new, most powerful Dell XPS 13 takes 12 minutes and 50 seconds, with the fans screaming, whereas the air is completely silent. Like I said at the start, this thing is stupid fast. So now that we've proven the performance, let's answer the biggest questions most of you have. How much slower is the air compared to the Pro since it's fanless? And should you get the 8 core graphics option? And with that, should you get 16 gigs of RAM. Yes, the Air does run hotter than the Pro under sustained load, and the performance does drop over time, as I found in Cinebench, with a total of about a 15% loss once it fully heats up, which takes about 7 minutes. But after that, it performs consistently for hours. Overall, the same M1 chip in the MacBook Pro is 20% more powerful under sustained 100% CPU loads, but doing that is quite rare, so what does that mean for real-world performance? As I mentioned, I previously wouldn't recommend the Air for photo and video editing, but now it is surprisingly capable, so I decided to push it to its absolute limits, starting with exporting 500 42 megapixel raw images that have a bunch of color changes to fully test thermal throttling in the real world. Our 13 inch MacBook Pro took 29 minutes and three seconds, which is shockingly fast as even desktop PCs struggle with these massive files. And the MacBook Air took just three and a half minutes longer, even though it's completely silent. And this is one of the few tasks where I can actually hear the MacBook Pro's fans spin up. Three and a half minutes is nothing unless you do this each and every day. With that, the actual photo editing smoothness is the same. Next, I threw the toughest video editing test that I have at the Air, which maxes out the seven core graphics and uses a ton of CPU. The Pro took 27 minutes and 30 seconds to export, and the Air took just two and a half minutes longer. I also tested this on my Mac Mini, which has by far the best cooling out of the three M1 Macs, and mine also has 16 gigabytes of RAM, and that was only three and a half minutes faster than this fanless MacBook Air. So does thermal throttling matter with the MacBook Air? No, not really. I would definitely not buy the Pro just because it has a fan. And that's how many of us tech YouTubers were wrong. We expected the Air to perform quite a bit worse than the Pro since it was fanless, and you can't really blame us because every other fanless machine in the past would thermal throttle like crazy. That is until the M1 MacBook Air. 
Because of that and how well Rosetta works to translate Intel-based apps like Lightroom Classic and all of the other improvements that I already mentioned, the MacBook Air is the perfect laptop for almost everybody. And 95% of you that are trying to decide between the MacBook Air and the Pro should get the MacBook Air. And no, I wouldn't spend the extra for the eight core graphics. And as far as RAM, from our testing, eight gigabytes of the new unified RAM seems to act like 16 gigabytes of regular RAM. So if you were fine with 16 gigs before, you should be fine with eight. But if you wanna see my real world RAM stress test with the Pro that's also completely relevant with the MacBook Air. You guys can check out that video after this one. The M1 MacBook Air is the first perfect laptop that I have ever tested, at least as close to perfect as possible. And considering the price point and form factor, I have zero complaints. Now, of course, you can't run Windows yet on this machine, but Vadim does have a gaming video going up tomorrow where he actually runs different Windows games. And yes, you can't use an eGPU on this Mac, at least for now. But with that said, the previous MacBook Air was pretty much worthless, even if you attach an eGPU because of thermal throttling. So with that said, I consider the M1 MacBook Air Perfect. Oh, and one last thing. I thought that the instant on thing was kind of gimmicky, but after using this and going back to an Intel Mac, the three to five second startup after a deep sleep frustrates the heck out of me now. Also, the battery life is absolutely ridiculous. For normal use, most people will only need to charge every three to five days. Go ahead and let me know your thoughts down in the comments section below, and I have links to the best deals in the video description. Click that circle above if you guys want to help us reach our goal of 600,000 subs before our two year mark and check out the Ram stress test video right over there. This has been Max and I will see you in the next video.